McKay here, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. Four days before Christmas in 1943, a badly damaged American bomber struggled to fly over wartime Germany. At its controls was a 21-year-old pilot, half of his crew lay wounded or dead, and this was his very first mission that he was flying. Suddenly out of nowhere, a German fighter plane came up and lined up directly behind this bomber's tails. And flying this German fighter was a German ace pilot, one of the best in the German Air Force. And with just a squeeze of the trigger, this German pilot could have taken this bomber down. But he didn't do that. Instead, he just did something that was absolutely incredible. This incredible story became the the topic of a book called A Higher Call, an incredible true story of combat and chivalry in the war-torn skies of World War II. And today on the podcast, we have the author of that book, Adam Makos. We're going to talk about this event that brought together two enemies and the unlikely story of how they became friends uh, with just this this chance encounter. It's a fascinating and, and very touching podcast. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Uh, so let's get on with the show. Adam Mikos, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brett. Glad to be with you. All right. So you have uh, made it your life's calling in a lot of ways to tell the stories of the men and women who took part in World War II. Um, But before we get into your company, Valor Studios, and some of the books you've written about World War II, what piqued your interest about World War II? Because you're you're a young person. How old are you, and uh, and how did you get started being interested in World War II? Well, Brad, I'm 33, and uh, I've been studying World War II um, pretty much as a career for the last 15 years. So I started very young. Um, my grandfathers got me interested. One was a Marine stateside, and the other one flew in B-17 bombers in the Pacific at the tail end of the war. And growing up around my grandfathers, uh, that really, that did it. We went to air shows together. We went to museums. They showed me their photo albums. And I was just so lucky that, uh, that I was able to grow up with them in my lives, in my life. And, um, that's pretty much where it came from. I was just enamored with that era for some strange reason. I didn't understand it at the time. I was a teenager. But now that I've I've come to study them, I know why it called to me. And you didn't just let your interest sort of, you know, stay as an interest. You actually did something as a teenager with that interest. Uh, and this led to the formation of your company, Valor Studios. Can you talk about how Valor Studios came to be? Because I think the story is just just really fascinating. And then what does Valor Studios do exactly? Well, well thank you. It's uh, Valor Studios these days is a, uh, a publishing company that celebrates uh, the heroes, mostly from World War II, from Korea, from Vietnam a little bit, and, and celebrates them by publishing. We publish a magazine. We publish fine artwork. And, uh, and we, in many cases, uh, will take veterans back to the battlefields, anything to keep history alive. It began as a as a small little newsletter on a rainy day. Uh, my brother, my friend, and, and myself were 15 years old, 14 years old, and um, and it was a rainy day, and we had our first computer, and we said, let's make a newsletter, let's play journalist, and we had to decide what subject to write about. Do we write about Ferraris? Do we write about um, the Wild West? Do we write about football? Instead, we decided, let's write about our grandfathers. Let's write about World War II. And this little newsletter that was one page, it suddenly became two pages, and it became ten, and it sold to our family and our friends, and then it started to sell to the public. And the newsletter over time became a magazine. And through that magazine, we were we were telling the stories of World War II veterans, guys in our hometown. And then it became very famous World War II veterans. And then this little magazine eventually started to um, publish artwork because we would use art to tell our stories. And we thought, why not just commission paintings that, that can vibrantly tell the stories of these battles and and sell them then to the public so people could hang this on their wall and be reminded 365 days a year of these heroes that we had discovered. And so Valor Studios is still in operation to this day, and it's kind of fueled my book uh, publishing career, which has uh, really taken a lot of the recent years. Um, but working with these heroes has, has shaped my life in a lot of ways. So when you were a young man, what you would do is you would just, would you interview these World War II veterans and then just write their story in the newsletter? 
We would, and uh, it was, um, again, it was a SBD dive bomber pilot. It was a P-51 pilot. And then we started to discover that um, we wanted to tell the story of men who served on submarines. We wanted to tell the story of Marines in the Pacific or a, a tanker in the European theater. And uh, and so we worked with these men. And, and at the time when we started, they were 80, 81. Well, now you don't need a World War II veteran who is in 90, 91, 92. And so we've had, I always say, I, I grew up with a hundred grandfathers and, uh, and, and they became my best friends and sadly they've been disappearing one by one by one. But, but the, the lessons remain and that's what I try to put in these books. Uh, everything I've learned from, from these mentors. That's, yeah, it is really sad. Um, do you, about the, the declining number of World War II veterans who are still around, do you have any numbers on how many veterans we still have who are alive? Oh, goodness. I had heard a new stat not long ago, and I, it totally escapes my mind. But what I've, what I've seen, Brett, is that in a unit, say, let's talk about the Band of Brothers. They have 200 men and officers at one time, roughly. And, um, and we find that there's about a dozen left. Um, so, so that's kind of the number you're facing. In any given World War II unit, you probably have about 5% or fewer of the men remaining these days. And, and it's it's a sobering statistic, and it makes it very hard to to write a future book. Um, so so time is of the essence. Yeah, you're trying to get as many of them written down as you can. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm curious. You said that you um, you started this with a pa- was it a paper newsletter that it started out with? Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, it just started out on an inkjet printer, and then uh, and then over time it became professionally published, and it's still published. It's called Valor Magazine. It's the official magazine of ValorStudios.com, and um, and and through that time, Brett, um, we've worked with some of the most uh, in- indelible figures. Um, one in particular, Dick Winters, was a, a very good friend, uh, leader of the Band of Brothers, and. Um, and as well as Hal Moore, the hero of Vietnam, and, and Len Lamell of Point the Hawk. And I don't know if you want, I, I, I have learned uh, a common lesson from them. I don't know. If I would love to like hear to share it. that. Yes. Well, well, they, these men were, uh, of course, we all know winners, leader of the paratrooper, uh, unit easy company. Uh, we know Hal Moore. You might have seen We Were Soldiers once and Young, uh, the movie, the book. Uh, he was played by Mel Gibson in that. And then Len Lamell, he's one of those figures that, man, he should have had his own TV show. He should have had his movie. He was the ranger who led uh, one of the companies during the attack on Point the Hawk. He was, uh, he, he was uh, I guess you could say Saving Private Ryan was partially based on, on him. Tom Hanks' character was very much inspired by Len Lamell. And, and the common thing that each one, each one told me at one time or another, and this was the only overlap I ever heard, and it was about fairness and and they would say it's so imperative to the success of a unit a military unit to a company uh to a family uh len lamell once looked me in the eyes he said i'm going to tell you something you've got a good family and it's important that you're fair to them fairness is everything and it's how i was successful in war and in life and dick winter said the same thing you've got to be fair to your men if you want respect and and Hal Moore, the same principle, and I and I I I guess that's one of the things that's a, it's an ultimate challenge in this day and age because, as you know, so much of our careers and and our lives are about American society is based around getting as far as you can for yourself. It's a it's a very uh, inward inward focus that's promoted. How how many friends can you get on Facebook? How many likes can you get? How much money can you make in your job? And it's and 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 what's the pretty? Who's the prettiest girl you can date? And it's all a self-based mindset. And these men are saying, no, no, no. The way to succeed in life is to be concerned about the people around you and to be fair to them and to be good to them. And then those people will lift you up. So it's kind of a reverse thing. You don't lift yourself up. You're good to the people around you, and they'll take care of you. And and it's it's a good lesson. I try to practice this all the time. That's a great a great lesson. I'm a, you you mentioned earlier that uh, one of the things that Valor Studios does is you take soldiers or veterans to uh, battlegrounds. Do you have any stories where 
when, when you did that, you accompanied a veteran to a battleground and there was, you know, what, what sort of response do you see from the veterans? Do they, some of them get very um, thoughtful or pensive or do some of them just start telling stories? What, what happens when you do that? That's, that's a fine question. Every, every man reacts differently, but, but today on the anniversary of the Battle of the Bulge, uh, 70th anniversary, I think to a trip where we brought um, Shifty Powers, Earl McClung, uh, Bill Garnier, Babe Heffron, uh, Buck Compton, and Don Malarkey back to the site of the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, what we did, we brought them originally to visit the troops of the, um, uh, of the 1st Armored Division who had just come back from Iraq. And so it was kind of our own little USO thing to give back uh, to our military. This was a couple years ago. And afterwards, we toured the battlefields with the men. And um, for Shifty and Earl to go back to those foxholes, it was it was very eerie because we were there on the anniversary. And suddenly, this man uh, crossed the street and walked out of the mist. He was another old man, and he came and steps stepped into our midst. And uh, and sure enough, he was a German soldier. Uh, now he was 88 years old or so, just like our men. And um, and we started through a translator talking to this man, and he was there for the anniversary as well. And and we found out that he had fought across the street from them. And um, and Shifty and Earl said, "Come here, let's get a photo together." And 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 the, the he this man had been a Volksgrenadier uh, officer, German soldier, you know, shipped right out of Germany to to fight this battle. His unit was all young young boys and and old men. And um, and he said, you know, we were so scared of you. We would see the the white eagle on your shoulder, and we said, uh oh, the eagle heads are coming, and, and and it terrified them. Well, these men are getting their photos together and they're smiling. And Earl said, hey, to anyone who's gathered around, because there were soldiers with us, it was my family. And he said, everyone, take a picture. This is not something you're going to get to see every day. You've got the good, and he pointed himself to himself and then he pointed to the German. He said, you got the bad and then you got the ugly and he pointed to Shifty <laughs> and everyone around just, just got a laugh out of it. And uh, I think that was a, that was a powerful moment. Uh, and, and later on, I guess it would shape me because not only w- did I get to see the emotion that these men still carried so many years later, I got to see someone from the other side and, and I got to see how, Earl and Shifty weren't afraid to put their arms around this man. This was a man they had fought. He had probably tried to kill them. They had tried to kill him. Earl had probably killed several of his men because there was a big battle where Earl ran across the road once, and he killed uh, four men in one, one, one engagement. And yet, all these years later, those men, as Shifty Powers famously said in Band of Brothers, you know, maybe we could have been friends that German and I. Maybe he liked to fish. Maybe he liked to hunt like I do. Maybe we could have been friends. And I think that, that attitude has um, has shaped my work in recent years in this military field, trying to understand both sides of the same story. Continuing on that sort of same line of American soldiers and German soldiers being friends, you uh, wrote a New York Times bestselling book. It's been on the New York Times bestselling list for, was it 23 weeks? Yes, yes, it did. It was um, outstanding uh, beyond anyone's expectations, Brent. Yeah. Really incredible. It was called A Higher Call. And it's just an amazing, amazing story. And for listeners who haven't haven't heard about the story that The Higher Call is based on, can you give us the gist of it, of, of what happened? How did this happen and why did it happen? I'd be, I'd be glad to. It was, uh, a higher call is a story I discovered when I was working for our small magazine. See, as a, as the editor, a lot of stories would come across my desk. People would say, you need to do this story. You need to do that one. And I kept hearing from World War II veterans, you've got to tell the story of the German who let the American bomber go. And I thought, wait a second. This is a tall tale. This did not happen. Because, you know, a lot of times you see sensational things. And, and if it's too good to be true, it usually is. Well, I tracked down this story, and I found out there was some truth to it. This American bomber pilot, Charlie Brown, uh, was flying a B-17 back in December 1943. It was his crew's first mission, and reportedly uh, they had been badly damaged. They were just limping home, trying to escape Germany, when a German fighter ace came up, flew alongside of them, didn't shoot them down, and more so, he saluted at them and flew away. 
I thought it was uh, too incredible until I called the American pilot, Charlie Brown. I tracked him down in Florida. He was living in Miami. And I said, Charlie, is there any truth to this? And if so, I got, I've got to tell this story. And he said, Adam, let me tell you this. He said, you're starting about it the whole wrong way. He said, in this story, I'm just a character. The German is the hero, and his name's Franz Stiegler. And if you really want to do this right, you're not going to talk to me. You're going to go talk to the German first. He's still alive. I'll put you in touch with him. And after you get his story, then you can come get mine. I'm just a character. And so that's how it started, Brett. And I, I went out to, to interview this German, a man named Franz Stiegler, to discover this incredible World War II story. Well, why did, yeah, I mean, that's amazing that, I mean, what Stiegler did was he escorted the safety of this American plane. In a lot of ways, that's an act of treason, right? Was that an act of treason that he, what Stiegler did? It certainly was. And in that day and age, and I spent about a week with Franz Stiegler. And then later on, I interviewed him over years and years and years. And then I interviewed Charlie and he gave me his story as he promised. And, and I discovered that this, this story was larger than life and it was true. Uh, Franz Stiegler had, had been, uh, had shot down an American bomber that day and he had landed to rearm, refuel when this B-17 flew overhead. And he saw it and he jumped in his Messerschmitt 109 fighter and tracked down the B-17. And when he came up behind it, he was poised to shoot it down, but, but something changed in him. Something clicked and, and he had decided to spare it. Um, the, uh, gosh, I, I guess I could, would you like to know why? I, yeah. I guess the moral, moral, well, well, Franz's moral, uh, explanation took place earlier in Africa. He, he was a young fighter pilot. Um, he had joined because his brother was killed in World War II as a pilot. Franz would have been happy to have stayed out of the war. He was a flight instructor for the German Air Force. But when his brother died, everything changed, and he went to war seeking revenge. And in Africa, before his first mission, his squadron commander was a man named Rodel. And this Rodel, uh, Gustav Rodel, said, Franz, what are you going to do today if you shoot down a plane and you see a man in a parachute? Are you going to hold your fire? Are you going to shoot him? What are you going to do? And Franz said, I don't know, sir. I'm, uh, I'll figure it out when it, when it happens. And Rodel said, well, let me tell you what you'll do. He said... If you end up shooting a man in a parachute and I hear of it or I see it, I'm going to shoot you myself. And this is before Franz's first mission, and he's already scared to death. And Rodel said, listen, let me tell you why I say this. He said, you fight by the rules of war, not for yourself. You fight by the rules for your, not, I'm sorry, not for your enemy. You fight by the rules for yourself. So that someday, if you survive this war, you can live with yourself. You can look yourself in the mirror. And someday when you face God, you can, you can face him with a clean conscience. That's why you fight by the rules of war. And so Franz learned that lesson that day. And he carried it into his career. Because he was very lucky. Had he reported right to the Eastern Front, where, where the fighting was so violent and, and so hateful, uh, he may have never learned such a lesson, and he may have killed Charlie Brown and his crew that day. Instead, because he went to the desert, there was a strange sort of war being fought in early 1942, and it was the British and the Germans were fighting by the rules of World War I, where you showed respect to your adversary, where chivalry was still practiced. So if a man was shot down behind the enemy lines, uh, a German doctor would care for a British soldier, or a British airman. Uh, the, the British showed the same courtesies. A lot of times a shot down pilot or a captured pilot would be hosted at a dinner by his captors. Um, there's a story of a, of a British pilot who was shot down and badly burned. Later, a German pilot flew over the British lines and dropped a, a letter to the man's comrades to say, uh, I'm, a, I'm a sad to report that your friend has died of his wounds. We did all we could. And so that was Africa. And Franz was very lucky. And, and that's what that's what made Franz make that decision on December twentieth, nineteen forty three. Wow. Why was it that Africa had that that chivalry mindset as opposed to the other arenas of war? I would say it was uh, it was several things. It was the common hardships. These men were thrown out in the desert. It was the same enemies from World War One, so they had fought each other before. And uh, everyone was suffering. We're all alone in the desert. We're all forgotten back home. 
our girlfriends are probably dating someone else. Um, you know, we miss our families. They were all suffering the same hardships, and it wasn't personal between them. You know, the the Churchill sent that, the British to the desert. Hitler sent the Germans to the desert. Nobody wanted to be there. And uh, and also, this sounds a little strange, but um, the, we hadn't entered the war yet. The Americans weren't in the desert at that point. And um, and when we came into the war, I think we brought a different attitude. And it was, we don't want to be here. We're here to fix your mess for the second time in, in 20 years. You know, we're going to win this war. And we, we brought a new level of, um, I guess you could say, pragmatism and, and, certain, and, and a certain sort of savagery to the air war. Uh, we said, we're just going to destroy the German nation. We're going to destroy every fighter pilot we can. We're going to win this war. And so whereas the British and the Germans could afford to be sportingly at the beginning of the war, when we came in, it was the gloves, the gloves were off. And so I, I think that's what, that's what created a different theater. And also it was very different from the Eastern Front where there was, um, there was another sort of, um, there was a, the, the propaganda and the, and the racial savagery where it was the Germans and, and, and Russians looked at each other as inhuman. Whereas in the desert, the British and Germans had that attitude that said, well, you know, we might have been friends if it, if we weren't born on the wrong side. Hmm. So Stiegler, a German pilot, escorted Charlie Brown, an American pilot. Did Stiegler suffer any consequences for his action or did he – did it just this fly under the radar? He, he was very lucky, Brad. He never mentioned it to a single soul. Um, back in that day, uh, that summer of 1943, for example, a woman who was working in a munitions plant had told a joke about Hitler. And she said, Hitler and Goring were up on top of the Berlin radio tower. And Hitler said, I want to put a smile on the faces of the people of Berlin. And Goring said, well, then why don't you jump? And that was the joke. And she told it and someone overheard her and they reported her to the Gestapo and she had her head cut off by the guillotine that summer. So Franz Stiegler escorts an American bomber out of German territory. He, he, he salutes the pilot, flies away. That would have been treason times 10, and he would have been shot, and, um, and he could never speak of it. And that's why this story laid quietly for so long. He couldn't speak of it during the war. After the war, he put the memories behind him, and, and it stayed dormant for 50-some years. Wow. So you mentioned that Charlie Brown and Stiegler were friends. Like Brown knew how to get in contact with Stiegler, but how did that happen? Because for Brown, I'm sure he looked across. He's just, you know, Stiegler's just some random German pilot, right? How did Brown track exactly. down Stiegler uh, and get in touch with him? Well, this was this was a second one in a million or one in a billion happenings, and that's why I was so lucky with a higher call that both men were alive because I could I could examine this. Uh, Charlie only saw this man's face. And inside of his cockpit, Franz was saying, good luck, you're in God's hands. And then he flew away. He said, I've done all I can do. And um, and he had done a lot. You know, He had escorted him out of Germany when he could have just flown away. He didn't have to stay with this bomber. But Franz knew if another German fighter pilot came along, they wouldn't molest this bomber with him there, with him flying alongside of it. But if they found it alone, they would they would knock it into the sea because the plane was defenseless. So all these years later, Charlie Brown realizes that, that he's alive because of this German. And at a bomb group reunion, he told his buddies, he said, you know what? I remember that one time I was saluted by a German fighter pilot, and everyone just laughed at him. And once they were done laughing, they said, seriously? And he said, yeah, and he told the story. Well, a man named Joe Jackson, one of the pilots that day, said, Charlie, you owe it to this man to try to find him. You owe it to yourself. And Charlie said, how am I going to do this? Fifty years have passed. This is like 1988. And, uh, and so Charlie begins. He puts ads in magazines. He searches the archives. And he gets lucky. He gets very lucky. He places an ad in a German fighter pilot magazine called Jägerblatt. And it was read by any of the German fighter pilots since World War II. So you have Cold War guys. You had you know, men of all ages. And the ad said, looking for the German pilot who saved my life over Bremen. If you know the details, 1943, if we we flew together, if you know the details, contact Charlie Brown. 
Well, Franz Stiegler had moved to Vancouver, Canada to work in the lumber industry after the war. He couldn't live in his hometown anymore. He had lost his family. He had lost his friends. He had lost his country, effectively. He had seen his city bombed. And, and he knew that Hitler was the cause of all that. And he, and he, and he hated that part of his, of his people. So he left and he lived in Vancouver and he got that ad and he got his magazine. He found that ad and he wrote Charlie a letter. And all he said in this letter was, I'm just glad it was worth it. I wondered all these years if your bomber made it back to England and if you survived the war or if you crashed and ended up in a watery grave. I'm glad it was worth it. Well, Charlie Brown got this letter and he went crazy and he called the Vancouver operator and he said, find me Franz Stiegler. And the two men talked and they agreed to meet and Charlie flew all the way to Seattle and Franz came down and the two hugged and they cried. And there's a really cool video, Brett, that um, that people can find if they just go to YouTube or you're welcome to post it. It's uh, their first reunion. Someone filmed Franz and Charlie meeting and during this meeting, they tell their side of the story, and then Franz, Franz said, I love you, Charlie. And this is this hardened German fighter pilot on camera sniffling and saying, I love you, Charlie. That, to me, was an incredible thing, and that tells anyone who sees it, this is not just a tall tale. This story is the real deal. Wow, that's an amazing story. Um, One of the... Uh things I found interesting about a higher call is that you really humanize the German pilots, uh, instead of, and it's not just Franz Stiegler, it's all of them. I mean, instead of painting them as terrible villains, a lot of these pilots, they just come off as guys doing their job and they oftentimes don't even support the Nazi government. Was it difficult for you personally to get past the tendency? I think many Americans have right to villainize Germans and get to know more about the men on a human level? It certainly was because I had spent my whole career interviewing my American buddies, you know, these old bomber pilots and gunners. And I thought, wow, these Germans were trying to kill my friends. Uh, and, and I thought they were reprehensible. Only when I started to write this book um, did I step into the shoes of Franz Stiegler. I had to. Charlie made me do it. He said, you have to talk to the German first. You have to understand his side. So then I go back into Franz's uh, you know, hit into his shoes, and he's just this young man who loves flying gliders in in the in the thirties, and and he considered becoming a priest at one time, and his dream was to fly. Well, suddenly this Hitler guy comes to power. Franz is like sixteen years old. Most of the Germans who fought in World War II when Hitler came to power, they're twelve years old, they're fifteen, they're tw- they're thirteen. They don't follow up politics. They don't know who this guy is. And then I had to look at it, and I said, well, what did Franz know about this? What part did he play in bringing this evil to power? And I find out that, really, in this last election that Germany had, 1933, when everyone voted, uh, Hitler, the Nazi party, won the election effectively with 44% of the vote. And so they, uh, the Farmers' Party took votes, the Catholic Party, the Democrat Party, the Communist Party, everybody split the votes. The only true bloc was the Nazis. So 56% of Germany was against them, 44% was for them. And this is, this is in 1933. And so when I, I came to realize that if you want to just paint things in black and white, you know, photos or black and white, uh, imagery, half of Germany liked Hitler and half of them were against him from the start. And Franz's parents had voted for the Catholic Party. They were they were Bavarian Catholics, and and so I came to realize that when this guy came to power, he soon took over the postal service. He took over the military. He took over the roads. He took over the pensions. He took over the media. He took over every facet of government. So by the time these German boys are fighting in World War II in 1942, 1943, you know they. They had been born into Hitler's Germany for all effective purposes. There was no freedom of choice. And so, uh, although some, you know, some were truly evil, and let's just say half the country was truly evil, guys like Franz were just born in the wrong place at the wrong time. And a lot of fighter pilots I found, I couldn't have written this book about an SS company. I couldn't have even written this book about, say, a, a Wehrmacht company on the Eastern Front because the horrors were true. For fighter pilots, these were independent thinking men. Uh, they were mavericks. 
And, and they were on the outs with the Nazi party from, from very early on because in the Battle of Britain, when the German fighter pilots failed to defeat the British Royal Air Force, Hitler and Goring and Goebbels and all the, the, the Nazi big shots said, hey, German people, do you know why we lost the battle? Not because, not because we're, we're not superior. We lost the battle because the fighter pilots lack courage, because the fighter pilots let you down. And so the fighter pilots came to hate, largely, hate the Nazi party, hate their own government very early in World War II. And, and from that point on, they were just flying to defend their country and to, to see the end of the war. And they knew they were going to lose the war. And so there was a great deal of bitterness. So when I got to know these Germans on a, on a, on a human level, I learned that amid the fighter, fighter units, yeah, you had your bad apples, but largely, those guys were no different than our fighter pilots. They're no different than our fighter pilots today, no different from our fighter pilots from the beginning of time. They're a lot like us. What did you personally learn from writing a higher call about being a good man? Hmm. The, the big lesson that Franz was taught as a boy, uh, he, was, uh, he loved to fly gliders, and his dad was a World War I pilot. And one day they had wrecked the glider, and Franz was repairing it in the wood shop. And his father came in, and he said, Franz, you're using a lot of glue on these parts. You're, you're being sloppy. And Franz said, oh, don't worry, father. It's, it'll be covered with canvas. You're never going to see this part of the, of the machine. And his father said, Franz, I have to tell you something. He said, take the glue off. Do it all over again. You, even if no one sees it, you do the right thing, especially when no one sees it. Because you'll know it's there. You'll know you did it wrong. You know you were sloppy. And, and it was, it was a, quite a lesson for a 14 year old kid to learn. You know, to do the right thing when no one's looking, even if no one will see it. And I think that's a very important, important lesson. Uh, for Franz, it had a faith component. It was that God is watching you and he sees everything. He was a Catholic. But uh, I think it, it it just comes down to also a character thing. It comes down to that same reason that Rodel said, you 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 uh, spare a man in a parachute for your soul. You know, the way we today live our daily lives is a reflection of what we think about ourselves and, 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 and the person we believe ourselves to be. Well, if you do nasty, corrupt things and if you do evil things, other people may not catch on. You may not get in trouble, but you know it, and it corrupts your soul slowly. A man like Franz Stiegler, he spared Charlie Brown that day when he had the power because he realized the importance of looking after his character. It's, yeah, Higher Call, it's, it's just an amazing story. And for all of you who are listening right now, I, I hardly recommend you go out and, and get pick up the book. Um, but that was not the only book about World War II you've written. Um, after that, you co-wrote a book with the uh, Art of Manliness contributor, Marcus Brotherton, uh, Voices of the Pacific or Voices from the Pacific. What made you want to do about a book about the stories of the men who fought in the Pacific theater during World War II? Well, Brett, I had, I had long wanted to write about them. I had, as a young boy, I had read about the battles of Tarawa and Peleliu and, um, Tarawa was like the, the opening scene in Saving Private Ryan, the Normandy Beach scene, for hours and hours and hours and days. It was just that kind of slaughter. And, um, you know, all, and the, the Marines, you know, everybody was, at the time, everyone was so fascinated by the paratroopers in Europe because it was kind of a romantic thing, the idea of liberating a French town and, and, um, fighting your way to, into Germany to, to end Hitler. And, the the Pacific was still forgotten, and yet these men had endured uh, an unthinkable hell because they faced elements that were um, were just they would they would drive a man insane normally, and so uh, they fought an en enemy who was so savage and so sadistic that you know you would surrender to a German, and and the German mortality rate in POW camps was about four percent. If you surrender to the Japanese, the mortality rate was over 25% in their camps. And that's if you got to a camp, uh, if you were not tortured at first, if you were not um, beheaded. So I had a lot of respect for the Marines. And, and luckily, this miniseries, The Pacific, came along, HBO story. And it was okay. It wasn't great. Um, it, it didn't... 
the men who were who were there said, you know, some of this was embellished. Uh, some of this this movie was, oh, I don't know. There was some trashiness to it that the men of that era did not believe in. Um, and so they weren't exactly, Sid Phillips wasn't exactly thrilled by the Pacific. But I, Marcus and I decided to write this book to give the Marines who were there the final say. All right, the, the spotlight of popular culture is on the Pacific right now. Let's not let a TV series be the final word. Let's let the men have their voice. And so we interviewed, oh, well over a dozen Marines who fought on the various islands in the Pacific. And this was a very cool book because instead of me as a writer taking their stories and weaving them together, I I just inject a line here, a line there, and we let their stories flow from one to the next to the next. And they're all short little vignettes, but they fall into this beautiful sequence where they tell you the story of the, the war in the Pacific without some young editor like myself coming in and, and editorializing their words. It's like a it's like a crab cake. If you go out for a dinner or you know at a restaurant, you want a crab cake with all meat and minimal filler. And and I consider their voices to be the meat and and I keep the filler out of this one. Yeah, what I love about uh that book is that you when you read it, you you feel like you're sitting around a kitchen table just listening to these old these veterans telling them their stories. That's that's how it feels when you read it. That that was the goal, Brett. It was it was exactly that. It was a bunch of veterans, you know, late night, they're sitting around the table. Maybe they have a beer. Maybe they're playing cards. And you know what? They're, they're, they're just feeding off each other. And, and, and it's, they're not censoring it. That was one of the big things because, uh, my friend Sid Phillips, who was one of the Marines in the Pacific, he, he censored his stories for his grandkids. He said, Oh, no, I wouldn't tell them that. I don't want to give them nightmares. Well, I said, Sid, for this book, you know, let's take off the filter. Let's pretend it's just you and your buddies. And, and it's, it's a very brutal book. It's very raw, but it's, it's inspiring because you, you, you say to yourself, could I have survived the island of Peleliu? Could I have survived nearly a month on that island in 105 degree heat without water with the enemy, uh, shooting at me on the beach and shooting at me across the airfield? And then I have to go into the hills, into these coral hills and into these mangrove swamps to try to root them out. Am I tough enough? And, you know, I, I think, I don't think I am. I don't think in today's world, I think I've been raised too soft. I think we all care too much about our lives. Our lives are too precious to us. Uh, sacrifice was something that men back then didn't, they didn't fear it like we do today. Um, and, and so you ask yourself when you read this book, could I have survived the Pacific? Could I have fought alongside these men? And that's a question each of us can answer. What uh, projects can we expect to see you from you in the future, Adam? Well, I'm working on. I, I just finished a book that's that's. It's right along the line of a higher call. It's incredible story. It's it's called Devotion, and Devotion is a story from this forgotten war, the Korean War. And I always thought I go into all these things, Brett, just from the same standpoint as a lot of readers. Uh, it's just like with Franz Stiegler. Oh, I don't want to learn about the Germans. You know, I don't. They're the bad guys. And then I immerse myself and I say, Holy cow! Same thing with this Korean War book. I I didn't think much of the Korean War. It seemed kind of muddy and it seemed kind of dirty and it was like mash. And then you know, Mad Men kind of flashes to it. And 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 so I, I didn't know anything about it. And then I discovered this story of of these Marines who, who marched into this frozen hell uh, in northern Korea. And we thought the war was about to be won. We're right on the Chinese border. We're about to destroy the North Koreans. We're going to come home, and it's just like World War II. We're going to be heroes. And then suddenly the Chinese attacked, and they entered the war. Well, most Americans don't even know that the Chinese fought in the Korean War. But one day our Marine Division woke up, and, and some 20,000 Americans were surrounded by 100,000 or more Chinese. And devotion tells the story of these two pilots who who flew into combat to try to save these Marines. So we follow the Marines on the ground, outnumbered um, twenty and I just uh, ten to one, and then we follow the pilots in above. And, and we follow two pilots in particular. One is a man named Tom Hudner. Uh, he grew up a white kid from uh, Massachusetts. Grew up in the country club scene. He had his whole life planned ahead of him. He could have had beautiful wives and an Ivy League education and just anything he wanted. 
the other pilot we saw was Jesse Brown, the first black pilot in the Navy. Jesse came from a sharecropper shack in Mississippi, dirt poor, and he believed he could be the first Navy pilot, and he did. And so we follow this uncommon friendship for 1950, for that era of segregation. And, and we follow these two men into battle. And eventually, I won't ruin the story, it's a true story. One of these two men is shot down behind enemy lines, on the side of a mountain, in the snow, and he's trapped in his aircraft, and his aircraft is catching on fire. And the other one said, I'm going in. And all the people in the air that day thought, what does he mean, you're going in? You're, you know, this, this fellow's on the side of a mountain. And the other man crashed his perfectly good Corsair fighter alongside of his friend on the mountainside to try to save him. And so... Again, it's that common common story of, of sacrifice and, and the courage of that generation. Because we forget, the Korean War was fought by the greatest generation. The the Marines were wearing the same helmet covers in World War II. They were wearing the same dungarees. They were shooting the same M1 Garands. The pilots were fought, flying the same Corsairs. They were dropping the same bombs. It was it was a five years after World War II. It was practically an extension of World War II. It was just a new battle where the allies of World War II... The forces of democracy and the forces of communism turned against each other and went to war on this nasty, frozen peninsula. So it was like a world war. It was a world war fought in Korea, and it's going to be a pretty epic book. It comes out in uh, in May, uh, Brett. It's called Devotion, and um, and we're expecting really big things from it. Yeah, well, we look forward to that. Well, Adam Akos, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been an absolute pleasure. Hey, it's 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 a it's great to talk to you, and and I, I enjoy art of manliness myself. I'm a follower. I'm a fan, and so it's nice to talk to my uh, my fellow um, my fellow friends. Uh, so thank you so much, Brett. Thank you. Our guest today was Adam Makos. He's the author of the book A Higher Call. You can find that on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Also, make sure to check out Adam's business, ValorStudios.com, where you can find the finest military art prints, collectibles, and signed books. You'll find uh, historical treasures signed by Major Dick Winters from the Band of Brothers, General Hal Moore, Franz Stiegler, who was the German pilot that helped out Charlie Brown. It's just a really co- cool thing, so go check it out. Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com. And until next time, this is Brett McKay wishing you a very manly Christmas and stay manly.